time next speaker. A man that has grown in his job and his job responsibilities. One that you hear out in the country as he carries the responsibility of representing the NFO in many areas of this country. It is a requirement in the type of structure we have that the national vice president be a spokesman for the NFO in many areas of this country. Because the president certainly doesn't have the time, nor can he be able to cover every subject that needs to be covered. The title of his speech today is going to be Responsible Leadership. I'm going to have to miss part of this be, to meet on some press interviews, but I want to say that I know and you know that we have a very responsible leader in our Vice President. This time it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you a hard-working, dedicated leader in this nation's fight for survival in rural America and for fair prices. I'm very proud to present to you our National Vice President, Devon Woodland. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Orrin Lee. Let me ex first express my appreciation to you as the delegates for the opportunity that I have of serving and representing you across this great land of ours. It becomes a thrill to be recognized as one who represents you because I'm convinced in my mind that the truest and the greatest quality of people is in rural America. It's obvious here today that Governor Exxon is a friend of American agriculture, a friend of the American farmer, and a friend of NFO. And this isn't always the case in many of the states across this country. We have those who don't understand. And perhaps for every one we do that does, there are two, three, four that doesn't. And I'm suggesting to you that you not only listen to what they say, but watch what they do. And if they understand and would represent you and your thoughts, support them. Work for them. And if they don't, you get a piece of their hide. You've been for two days now listening to commodity group reports. And you've seen those professional people who understand and know commodities and the programs that they represent. You'll be spending another full day with them tomorrow, and I'm not going to become involved in commodity program reports. They are much more qualified than I, but I want to touch for just a moment on a thought or two that I have. Over the years, you and I have prided ourselves as a farm organization doing everything ourselves. But we thought within our own sphere we had all the know-how to do everything that needed to be done. And it didn't take us long to realize that we didn't have and we lacked in some areas of having the knowledge and the know-how. 
And I'm sure there's still some within the confines of this organization that wonder as they see these professional people becoming involved in NFO programs. I want you to think for me through just a moment this topic. Twenty years ago, if a young man came out of a university or a college, a uni uh, an educational program, and he had some desire to pursue marketing, if he had some desire to pursue the cattle industry, the hog, the sheep, the milk, whatever, could not become directly involved in producing and being a tiller of the soil, but wanted to stay close in touch with it, where did he go? There was no place that he could go but to the industry. And there, many of those people went who had a very close relationship with the soil and would have done all within their power to preserve that element out there in rural America as owner-operator type units. And I submit to you that we have many within the industry that have been misplaced, who have moral values, who would like to serve and work with and help people but before the structure of NFO, they never had the opportunity. There was no way that they could. And I remember just yesterday, one of these men came to me, and he said, it's good to smile again. And I said, pursue it just a little. He said, in the industry that I've been with most of my life, I grew up in the yards here in Omaha as a boy. And my measure of success was in dollars that I could return to the company that I represented. The pressure was tremendous, and my only measure of success was how much money I could make for those whom I represented. Now, he says the pressure's in NFO, but it's somewhat different. The pressure here is, and the reason I smile, he said, is because I'm helping people. I'm teaching people to do something for themselves. And again, he said, it's good to smile. Well, let me assure you that we have within the circles of this organization men who now know the thrill of helping people. We're in an unbeatable position. Reason with me for a moment. If you were a player on a football team and you knew your game plan well, you stood a 50% chance of winning the game. But if by chance in that encounter you knew both teams' game plan, you would be in an unbeatable position. And I submit to you that today we know the game plan of both parties involved those whom we may suggest or recognize as our economic enemy. We understand the importance of supply to them because the people we now have understands the importance of it to them because they were there. They know the value of cuts. They know the value of carcass to the industry and the kind they must have. And so again I say, we're in an unbeatable position. Now, I've had my highs and lows as you have. There are times when I wondered if we were going to be successful. I tried to hide it, but there were times when the programs were not quite right. They just weren't clicking. Something was lacking. We couldn't quite put our finger on what it was. And I submit to you today, people, the programs are right. What we're doing is right. They're working. And all we need to do to complete the task that we set out to accomplish 22 years ago is do more of what we're doing. Well, this organization declared its position some 20 years ago to the world. And it said to the world that American agriculture is the most vital of all industries in America. 
the only one that can bring about a balance of world trade. And we have that responsibility to America, to the American people, and to this industry. And we better not sh shirk that duty. We're selling our grains and our commodities abroad. That's what we export. We don't export steel, petroleum. We export agriculture commodities. And we're importing the goods from these foreign countries at full dollar value and paying them in American dollars at full value. And then we try to balance the books by selling to them what we produce at 50% of value. There's no way to balance the books. I want those who make agriculture policies in this country to explain to me their reasoning behind programs where they will allow we in American agriculture to be exploited. And as the governor said, the EEC, the European Economic Community, they protect their producers domestically and they will not allow import grains to come in and destroy their domestic people. And those who buy import commodities, those in the milling refinery as buyers of import goods, they pay a duty that brings that cheap American grain up to domestic level. And then that two or three dollars is put in a kitty so when they export another commodity, they can pay their domestic producers so they can afford to come in on the low American market. And I don't understand the philosophy of people who are managing the agriculture affairs in this country. And I submit to them, they better enjoy it because their days are numbered. We run a survey of a little county in central Iowa, Adams County, where the home office is located. That survey showed that of a county of 6,000 people now, we rate a comparison between what it costs to produce a bushel of corn, what it costs to produce hogs, what it costs to produce beans, and then we took that cost of production and compared it to the current market value. And I have the figures here. I'm not going to re read them because of the time element. But the point I want to make is this. As we run the comparison figures, we found that in that little county of 6,000 people, gross income was shorted, cost versus current market, $20.4 million. $3,500 per capita. And how many counties have we got across the country that would be identical? 2,000, 2,500? That's $20 million that did not go to that bank. It's $20 million that did not go to the implement dealer, the automotive dealer, the drugstore, the dry goods, the grocery store. Hence that $20 million now reduced the standard of living in the whole community because we, the American farmer, has not totally accepted his responsibility to extract. Extract from those who have embezzled unjustly from him his rightful share and his rightful earned income. And as I read the Food and Fiber Report, and their plans for rural America, they said in that report that agriculture is too important to be left in the hands of the farmers in this country. And that the responsibility of that committee and those who direct agriculture policy in America is to see that the American farmer has an adequate income. 47% of the farmers in America received less than $5,000 per year for their labor, poverty level by standards. Now, I'm not s suggesting that we be overbearing and unruly and unkind and greedy, but I'm suggesting to you that we have a responsibility to America.
The day will come if we shirk that when we'll, we will hang our heads in shame. And those who know of our responsibility will ask us why. And I, for one, will be able to answer them that I done my part and hopefully I can hold my head high and explain to them how it was done, that they can enjoy the same thing that you and I will enjoy if success is ours. The farm debt in this country, the farm debt in this country in 1955 was $12.4 billion. In 1975, it was $91.7 billion. And projected for 1977, $118 billion farm debt. For 20 years now, we have been expecting this to happen. And in our own way, been telling those who would be willing to listen and understand. And we knew that if corrective action was not taken, that the time would come that we would see not only the farms being liquidated, but standard of living and people being destroyed. And that time is now. And we talked to you some time ago about the idea in collective bargaining and what it ought to accomplish. And I submit to you it's no longer an idea. It has today become a necessity for survival. An organization has a responsibility to give people direction. And this organization has assumed that responsibility and will give it leadership and direction. But you know, no organization ought to do for you what you can do for yourself. If an organization steps in and takes over from people, and I care not whether it be in agriculture, a civic group, or the government, they ought not to do for you what you can do for yourself. And they should fill the role. They should fill the role of doing for you what you cannot do individually. This organization has declared that it will serve and represent you, and our goals were well-defined and established. And I just want to say this. The OPEC countries in the world have brought this country to its knees. We have yielded to the whims and the desires of those who have learned to use the principle of collective bargaining. They used it. And I'm suggesting that perhaps maybe this country will have to be brought to its knees until they realize that food comes from a farm. And they're not going to get it until they pay for it. What would others do? What would others in our society do if they were not granted the increase which they asked for? What would the firemen do? You have seen and read where they have watched the buildings burn because they were denied their rights. You have seen the cities go unpatrolled by the law enforcement people because they were denied their just rights. You have seen the school teachers leave the classrooms unattended because they were denied their rights. And I submit to you that perhaps a food counter may become bare until we are able to establish our rights. We knew that there would be a twofold impact as conditions began to climax. 
We knew first the first impact would be the farmer and rancher and his real estate and holdings, his investment in that farm would become in jeopardy. And as far as the credit risk, he may be denied and questionable. Then that impact has hit. That impact has been so strong now that we are led to believe that some 800,000 farmers out of 2 million may be questionable as far as credit risk comes spring. We knew that would be the first impact. And we knew the second impact would come about when those merchants on Main Street were unable to collect accounts receivable. And that secondary impact has now set in. And it's no longer become a fight for the farm and the rancher. It's now become a battle for survival of rural America. And every farmer and merchant and businessman in rural America now has their livelihood on the line and at stake. Last year, 16,000 independent businessmen went by the wayside. And the numbers are projected to be substantially increased during the year 1977. Let me suggest to you that you make some very in-depth decisions. I don't know what you're going to do. And we can have a convention here that could and has all the earmarks with weather permitting. And I just learned before I came here just now that the storm has been extremely widespread and we've got some four-wheel drive vehicles out on county roads picking up people who had committed themselves to come. And so you're going to make some decisions while you're here and more importantly when you go home. And therein will lie the real determination of whether we have had a successful convention because there's where the work needs to be done. There's where we will either succeed or fail. And I suppose, as I've often said, and ask myself the question, why haven't we succeeded totally in our goal? Many reasons, perhaps, but some stick out more vividly in my mind than others, and one is this. I have been accused over the years, and you have said, and I have said, farmers will never organize. They won't trust each other. They aren't concerned about the neighbor to the left or to the right. They're only concerned about themselves. Why haven't we been more successful? One of the ladies I met with not too long ago, she said she went back to Washington and presented the case of the women's organization. And she was convinced that the solution wasn't there. And when she came back, she said, you know, they're afraid of one thing in the State House and in the national capital, and that is that farmers are eventually going to organize. And if they do, and if they do nationally, it will take away, they said, in international bargaining circles, their power at bargaining tables. And then she said, why don't we just go ahead and do it? She made it sound so simple. And maybe it is that simple. And maybe we're looking for something hard and long and drawn out. But it's a very simple thing to be done. All you have to do is trust each other, believe in each other, and be as concerned with each other as you are with yourself. That's all it takes. Embrace two very basic Christian principles. And if you can't do that, we will never succeed. And I submit to you the American farmer is and can and will organize himself sufficiently to do what has to be done. But you have been programmed, and I want to tell a short story. You have been programmed to believe that farmers can't organize nor can they trust each other. And you know why you have been led to believe that? Because you heard it said, and you probably said it, and read it somewhere. And it was good conversation, so you passed it on. And what in effect it was was an untruth that you were telling. Let me show you very, in a very simple way how you program someone to think as you would want them to do without really them being aware of it. I was home the other day, and the smallest of the family came to me after his mother had suggested he prepare for bed. 
And as he began to postpone the inevitable, resisting that assignment to go, he made a pass by the bookcase and picked up one of the little golden books that was there and came and sit beside me. Of course, that solved the immediate problem because he now had a refuge. And he asked me to read the book to him, which I did the first night in detail. And he liked that story so well, when the second night came, he came with a book again. And I sat and we read, read that story the second time. The third night, he came again with the same book, and I wasn't too interested in the book, but I decided I would read it to pacify him. And the fourth night, I wasn't about to read that book four times. And so I began to turn two pages at a time. You ever do it? You got caught, didn't you? Just like I did. Four years old, he couldn't read a word, but he knew what was to come next because I had told him. I had programmed him to think and believe what I had repeatedly read. Now the point is this. You have been told and programmed to believe that farmers can't organize. You've got to recognize that it is an untruth and allow yourself to take a complete turn and say to those who suggest it can't be done, it can, it is, and it will continue until we're totally successful. Again, you make the decision. Our responsibility is to give leadership. But that ability and that desire to become involved in programs must come from within. We can design a program that has all the aspects and all the possibilities of success. And there is no way that I can cause you to attach yourself to it. You must have that desire from within to attach to. And that decision is yours. The programs are there. The leadership role is ours. The leadership's responsibility is to foresee conditions that exist, review and study them in depth, and then not lead our people into a blind alley, but give them positive, progressive, very aggressive leadership toward that goal that's been well thought and well planned. And I submit to you, we will fill that role of leadership if you will fill your role, your responsibility to your organization. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Introduce the Secretary of Agriculture, who I know is giving every ounce of energy he can to do the most he can for the farmers of this nation. Secretary of Agriculture, Bob Berglund. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, my good friend, Orrin Lee, members of the National Board, those of you who are working for this organization, delegates, visitors, fellow members of this the hard-charging NFO, visitors and friends all. I am pleased to be home. I would like to just briefly comment about Charlie Thone. He and I, I've known Charlie a long time. He's a good guy, I tell you. He's a, he ought to be a Democrat, actually. He's a, he's a, 
He's my friend. Uh, he and I have a deal. Uh, I, I won't tell, uh, he won't tell the truth about me if I don't tell lies about him. <laughs> and uh, we've always gotten along. I must say, uh, Charlie and I served on the Committee on Agriculture, and I found him to be a truthful, straightforward, effective guy. Sometimes wrong, but never in doubt. <laughs> God give us each a mind to use. Each of us uses our talents in a different way. No two of us are quite alike. None of us think exactly the same. There is, therefore, honest disagreement from time to time as how we should make this a better place in which to live. And it's good that we have the ability to think for ourselves and on occasion disagree, for if we all thought alike, all you men would want my wife. <laughs> and so from time to time, uh, Charlie Thone working on the Republican side of the Committee on Agriculture and I working on the Democratic side did team up. And when we teamed up, we'd win. And there's a lesson, I think, in the successes and the failures that Charlie and I shared. That is, if we get together, if we team up, we can win. But if we engage or indulge in petty differences, we're going to be picked off. And so I'm pleased to be here on tonight with my good friend, Congressman Thone. It was about a year ago on Sunday last that Jimmy Carter called me and asked me if I would consider taking this job. I'd been elected to the Congress four times. I liked what I was doing. And I turned first to my wife of 27 years and said, Mom, what do you think? And she said, well, we've been through a lot together, thick and thin, more thin than thick. <laughs> so if you're willing, let's try it. I went to my minister. I go to him a lot. And I went to my minister, and I told him what had happened, and I said, what do you think? And he says, I'll pray for you. And I went to my dad. Dad's an old-timer, 82 years old, been around. I told dad what had happened, and he said, that's got to be the dumbest idea I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> He'd never heard of anything in all his life that was quite as ridiculous as anybody giving up what some regarded as a safe seat in the Congress of the United States to take a job from which there are there is not a very good future. <laughs> you know, when secretaries of agriculture leave, they kind of drop out of sight. Oh, if you go around on the dinner circuit and get 5,000 bucks for a speech. <laughs> but <laughs> most, of them, most of them get chased out and chased away. And so Dad and I were talking. And we agreed we thought it was about time that an NFO member became Secretary of Agriculture. Because <laughs> just maybe, just maybe, there are things that we can do that lawyers and school teachers cannot do. And so I went back to my wife and we started reminiscing. We'd been married five years before we had running water in the house. Now, mind you, we live up in the northern end of Minnesota. My friends are up here, our relatives, I suspect. Bernolf and Peggy Gron. I'm married to one of the Grons. I live up where we have nine months of winter and three months of tough sledding. <laughs> I got a co-op farm, me and the Federal Land Bank and production credit. And there was a time when it was more theirs than mine, but inflation has changed that. 
Anyhow, uh, we got thinking back over the years, uh, 27 years of married life, and remembering back before we had running water in the house. And I tell you, there's something about outdoor plumbing in Minnesota winters that leaves a lasting impression. <laughs> and we got thinking back, you know, I farmed 27 years and I've only had two average crops. They were the only two good crops I ever had. Got thinking back, you know, we remembered what it was like in 1957 when we didn't sell 10 cents worth of crop, nothing. It was all shot. It rained and rained and rained and rained, and we had the good crop coming that we needed so bad. Lost it all. 1966, a total loss. And so I know what it's like to see that crop coming and have it wiped out. I know what it's like, Charlie, when you talked about the banker and the customer that couldn't pay the interest and the principal. I've been there too. And to go to a banker and explain how it is and tell him that you're going to stay with him for another year ain't exactly as much fun as it might sound. Believe me, I know I've been there too. I know what it's like to have to sweat, laying awake nights and my wife crying because we couldn't pay the taxes. Now those are experiences that one never forgets. Oh, I've gone through the university and I've had all this high class schooling and I've been a lot of places. But I tell you, the lessons that we learned living through hard times are lessons that I will never forget. And so we decided to take the job. And it's interesting, to say the least. Oh, I've made some changes in there. That's a fact. You're, there will be more changes, too, as a matter of fact. And having been through the mill, I can appreciate those who on Saturday next are going to drive tractors to state capitals and into Washington, D.C. Because we have tens of thousands of people in the United States whose backs are to the wall. You know it and I know it. And the Department of Agriculture is going to do everything it can to help those in need. There are some things we've done, but we have a lot yet to do. I don't have to tell you that we're in trouble. I don't have to tell you that until just recently, we were told that fence-to-fence -fence farming is the way to get rich. My friends, the chickens have come home to roost. When I took this job in the latter days of January of this year, I went and looked at the records and it confirmed what everybody knew. We had the largest carryover of wheat in the United States we had in 13 years. The cattle producers had lost month money for 36 months in a row. That the price of grains generally were far below the cost of production. Now, all those things were not some deep, dark secret. You knew it, and I knew it. And so it was a matter of trying to work out policies and strategies that, first of all, are achievable, and second of all, can last and can work. And so guys like Charlie Thone and I, who sometimes disagreed, and other members of the Congress sat down and analyzed the situation. We all knew there would be no quick fix. We all knew that it was going to be difficult to develop a program that could pass the House of Representatives. Now, I'm not a lawyer and I'm not an economist, but I've been elected to Congress four times. In that business, there's one thing you learn pretty fast. You learn how to count. Believe me, if you can't count, don't get into politics. And Charlie Thone and I and Chuck Fraser, about whom I can't say enough good things, and Ann Bornstein, who does all the work. 
And Orrin Lee, and Orrin Lee and others of your board and I sat down and we examined the political situation. Now, if we were going to set up a program in which it was the farmers against everybody else, the vote in the House of Representatives would be 400 on one side and 35 on the other. And you know who'd lose? The farmers. Because there are only 35 districts in the House of Representatives in which we might call the farming to be the important industry. And so it was necessary that we go to our friends in the cities and suburbs, men and women who cared, men and women who understood, and present a program to them that showed them that unless we have strong, healthy, viable agriculture that the farmers of this country cannot produce for the consumers. The best thing the consumers of this country have got going and the best thing this hungry world has got going is a strong, healthy agriculture in the United States that needs some tuning. Because it's not as strong and it's not as healthy and it's not as productive as it needs to be. And so we passed a farm program. Now, I want to talk just briefly about what you and I can do. I know on Saturday next there will be demonstrations in various parts of the United States, and I'm in sympathy with what's being demonstrated because it does draw public attention to the plight of tens of thousands of farmers in the United States who are in serious trouble. But after Saturday goes by, then what? Then's the time when you and I got a job to do. Now is the time to use the tools you have built and through the NFO. There are some who are saying that the government should guarantee 100% of parity. I submit the government's safest course is to provide you with the tools that you can use so that you can achieve the cost of production plus a reasonable profit. Get control. Get control over your own destiny. Get control of your business. That's the way you're going to achieve the kind of incomes that you deserve. I know about your campaign to achieve the contracting of up to 30% of the crops and produce in this country. That's the way to go. Believe me, if you get 25% of it, you're going to regulate the price. I can tell you that. I can tell you that because this summer we raised the price support loan rate on corn, 50 cents a bushel, and I had a call, I was out in Indiana to a meeting down in the southern part of the state, and, and the corn out there was, was in August, and the corn was $1.58 a bushel, and the corn loan rate in the county was $2.06, because we'd raised it, and I had a call from a friend of mine up in Chicago, and he's a commodity broker up there, and uh, he's talking about some things, and he finally said, uh, can't understand why there isn't uh, more corn coming into the marketplace. I said, I can tell you why. I said, because we raised the price supports and we're financing grain. We're telling people to hold this corn back. Don't sell it for this ridiculous price. And we've got less than 25% of the corn under price support loan. And the price went up 50 cents a bushel. You bet you can do it. But we're going to have to work together. And so there are things that I can do to help you help yourself. When we came in in 
January and saw this big crop on hand and saw all the plans made for another tremendous corn acreage and another tremendous bean acreage, I knew and you knew that we were headed for disaster. And so we were looking at alternatives. What kinds of choices do we have? And I was getting all kinds of free advice. I was getting advice from some folks up in Chicago, markets up there, I was just looking for a little clipping. I happened to cut out of a daily newspaper. Don't have it in my pocket at the moment, but this little clipping was from the commodity section of this prominent national newspaper published in Chicago, and I won't mention the name. <laughs> this is on the ninth day of November, and the market analysts were going over the markets for the day, and corn had dropped. And the experts were trying to figure out why corn had dropped, and they agreed that corn prices dropped that day because the sun shined through the clouds over Chicago and the price of corn went down. <laughs> That's a fact. That's what the experts said. Now, nothing could be further from in the realm of reason than to have your, your business affected by such fickle things as that, the sun breaking through the clouds of Chicago and the price of corn drops. How ridiculous can it be? And we had some people that were offering me advice who said, the way to solve this uh, farm dilemma is lower the price supports, lower these prices, and we'll sell this grain. It'll go someplace. I said, you've got to be kidding. You've got to be kidding. This country needs dollars in our foreign trade. We need money in spite of the fact that the exports this year are an all-time record high. And that's a fact. Please turn the tape over to side number two for a continuation of the speeches. I didn't go to this university, but I went to Roseau High School. You know where that's at. And where I come from, I figure that you get more for corn when it's worth two bucks than you get for it when it's a dollar and a half. And we knew we were going to have corn and wheat coming out of our ears, and so we decided that the smart thing to do is raise the price supports. Then we had to figure out what we were going to do with this big crop of wheat on hand. And oh, there's some people said, well, we don't want reserves. Okay. But what about the 1,100 million bushels of wheat carried over from last year? I mean, it wasn't going to go away. We had two choices. One, we could build bin sites and take it into the hands of the Commodity Credit Corporation, and I've been through that mess, believe me, and I don't want to get back into that again. The second choice... <laughs> the second choice was the one we voted for. Build granaries. Finance a holding action. And so we changed... And so we changed the price support facility loans, urging farmers to put storage on the farm. That's where it belongs. Hold it at home. Don't let it get away from you. And it has been a huge success. We've had the biggest granary building program this year we've ever had, I think. Then we raised the price supports on soybeans and corn, as I've mentioned, and went on a campaign. Told grain growers all across the United States, use these tools, hold this grain back. And you know what's happened. Prices have been going up because you did it for yourself. If no one had used the loan program, if no one had gone out and borrowed money to build granaries, there would have been no increase in grain prices in the last three months. Now, the fight's not over by any manner of means, but the trend at least is in the right direction. And so that we can continue with this trend in the right direction, I have authorized a reseal on the 1977 crop. Contracts will be distributed sometime this winter asking farmers, for those who care, for those who care to participate, asking farmers to hold this wheat back, hold this corn back. We'll pay storage on it. 
we'll be able to provide the facilities that you can use so that you can bargain for 30% of the crop so that you can bring for yourself the kinds of incomes that you deserve. Now there are some who are wondering about this big wheat crop we had. We've just harvested the largest corn crop in the history, the largest soybean crop we've ever had, and we wonder about next year. We know that the exports now represent the production from one acre in three in these United States. And so farm policy and farm organization leaders have to think in a global context. It isn't like it used to be where we're principally concerned with taking care of ourselves in these United States as an island of isolation. Now we have to pay attention to what goes on worldwide. I know that the weather conditions in this world will have more to do with the size of the grain crop next year than all the government policies in this world laid end to end. I can tell you that the corn crop next year will probably be not less than four billion bushels and not more than six billion. And there isn't a soul in this room, there isn't a soul in these United States, there isn't a person on this green earth that knows what this crop condition will be like next year. Nobody knows. But we know the world has just produced two bumper crops back to back. Now the chances of a third crop in a row is almost zero. The chances are there will be a poor crop someplace in this world next year. I just hope it isn't in the United States. And if it doesn't come next year, it surely will come the year after. And so we're urging grain growers to store this grain, hold it back, because the need will come. The alternative would be to dump it, lower the prices, dump it, and let some international gambler pick this up, because he too knows that the crops will be poor someplace in next year or the year after, and the prices will go up. It's better that you cash in than to have someone else reap the profits. And so we're going to pay a great deal of attention to developing and expanding export markets. I've met with Orrin Lee and some of your national office personnel today, some of your customers overseas. I'm impressed by what I see. It's the very sort of thing that you and I need to continue to pursue. The world's food needs will double in 35 years. The world is depending on us. They're counting on us to be able to produce for their needs. I was in Japan in June of this year on a get acquainted trip and a trade promotion effort, and the Japanese officials with whom I talked were principally worried about dependability. They said, can we count on you in these United States? They still remembered the impact of the embargo. They were building a lifeline across the Pacific. And their reliance on the United States was not a matter of convenience, it was a matter of life and death. And if they can't buy it from us and depend on us to supply them a high-quality product at a reasonable price, and they weren't bargaining, they were principally concerned about whether or not they could depend on us. And I assured them they could. And I have assured other trading partners around this world that they can depend on us. I was in the Philippines, I was in Italy, and they were telling me about the noticeable improvement in the quality of grain that has been coming their way lately. We have a new law, and I want to give Charlie Thone credit for doing a tremendous job in putting into the new law the amendments to the Grain Standards Act. The Grain Inspection Act, which gave us the power to arrest and put in jail those people who take your good grain 
steal it and add sand and try to palm it off as American grain. We have new tough standards, new vigorous enforcement. And I've told everybody in the grain export business that the first one that violates the law will have the license pulled. I can do it for 30 days without a hearing, and I'll do it so fast, make your head swim. Because I was getting sick and tired of having good American grain find its way down to the Gulf ports and have some thief adulterated it. It cost you and me business. And now we have these new standards, and I must tell you that the American grain trade has cooperated 100 percent in this endeavor. They're doing a good job. In fact, just last week, we had two federal inspectors that had been offered a bribe down in a port in the Gulf by a ship captain who slipped them two envelopes with $200 apiece. They were there to inspect his ship to see that it was clean, to see that he hadn't added sand to the bottom. And he tried to bribe them, and they turned him in. They turned him in. They didn't take the money. They turned him in. I sent them a letter of commendation, and I called the authorities, and I said, nail this guy. Don't ever send that ship back to the United States. If we can help it, we don't want him around. We don't need him. When I was in Italy talking with millers, they were commenting on the high quality of grain which had been delivered in the last few months. The same story in the Philippines. They were immensely pleased. That's the kind of reputation that you can build through your export program, dependable suppliers of high quality produce. That's what they want. And so it's very important that you continue to pay attention to markets overseas. And I know that you're working in this regard and I commend you. We can provide you some help. We have just doubled the amount of money available for credit to finance the sale of commodities overseas. From $750 million, the President Carter has authorized us to go to one and one half billion. We have a credit survey underway to see what more it might take to finance the sale of these exports to people who need time. They're not all rich, you know. Some of them are very poor, in fact. Some need 40 years to pay it back. Some need seven. Some can pay cash in the barrelhead. But we need to work out programs so that whatever the customer needs, we can provide. You provide the grain, and we can help provide the credit. And you negotiate the sale, and you negotiate the price under terms and tools that we can help with. And so it is very important that you, working together with your colleagues all across the United States and with the government and with private industry, continue to develop markets overseas. And I won't go into the details of the new public law 480, but I'll say this. There's a new amendment to this law that new amendment allows us to use food aid as a developmental tool to help a hungry world help itself using food instead of providing guns and tanks and cash. And as President Carter has said, the right to eat is a basic human right respected the world around. And we intend to provide aid in that search for freedom through the Food for Peace program. And again, you provide the weapons in this arsenal designed to bring peace for all time. Food, the envy of the world. Finally, I know that Arne Lee has been discussing with you the creation of credit committees around these United States to analyze the credit needs of people no matter what age how big the farm. And I want to pledge to you our wholehearted and sincere cooperation. I have just recently issued a ruling down through the FHA. I said, stop all foreclosure actions. I don't want anybody chased out this winter.
No, I... I'm not authorized to grant a moratorium. I can't cancel debts. I can't cancel interest. But I can give time and terms. And I've told the FHA people, renegotiate these loans, extend, defer, renew, do anything you need to do within the law, but don't foreclose. And we're going to look to see what we can do to provide the kind of credit assistance that's worthy of the name the Farmers Home Administration. We have a $20 billion lending portfolio. I've been looking at it, believe me. We're supposed to be what they call soft lenders. The government's supposed to lend money to people who need help. Well, we have a lending portfolio that would be the envy of the hardest banker in New York. We don't lose money because we don't take chances. And I'd rather, I'd rather have a loan go bad from time to time than to drive some family out of wherever it is you live, up into Philadelphia looking for a job they'll never find and wind up on welfare. Or wind up in jail, as many of them do, and there it'll cost you and me as taxpayers $7,000 a year. No, my friends, we're better off taking a chance. And so we have prepared a package of amendments which we have sent up to the Congress which I've discussed with Charlie Thone and that have been developed, of course, with the advice and counsel of Orrin Lee and Chuck Fraser and your national officers, that will give us some new authority, some new flexibility, and I'm not going to go into all the details, but it will, for the first time since the days of the old Farm Security Administration, give us authority so we can adjust interest rates to people who need help down to levels they can afford work out repayment structures over time and terms that can be handled. And I've, you know, when I tell you about our early days farming, when I bought that first pay place on a contract for deed, we had $600, me and Ma. We didn't have anything to pay down on the farm, and we had tough going. And there were times I couldn't pay 1% interest. There were times I couldn't pay anything didn't make any difference what the interest rate was. I had to have time. Well, we made it. And I'll tell you, after I got in the Congress and my salary went to 42,500 bucks a year, it was a lot easier to borrow money. <laughs> tell you that, because I did that too. Now my salary is $67,000 and I don't need to borrow money. They come to me. <laughs> it's kind of interesting to have Kind of interesting to be on the, on the other side of some of these birds. But I'll never forget what it was like to have a back to the wall. And so we're asking for some help so that the county office of the FHA can work out a plan. If you get in trouble, let's defer, let's extend, let's renew. Let's work this thing out. And I'm delighted that you're planning to organize a credit committee because we need that kind of good, sound farmer judgment in the administration of these programs. Not just an FHA, but we need good, sound farmer judgment in the administration of all programs. And so I'm satisfied that if you and I hang in there, stay hitched, go home and enlist your neighbors, get five of them, and they get five more, And team up with your friends. Team up with your friends in the towns and the cities and the suburbs. Team up with your consumer friends. And Charlie and I have a little fun about Carol Foreman. You know, she's actually, she's, a, she's an Arkansas farm girl. That's a fact. And uh, she did such a good job criticizing the Department of Agriculture for so many years that I thought it'd be a good idea to bring her on board. And she's really an interesting person. And I know she gets under our skin sometimes. Uh, not mine, actually. I, I think she's the best thing that's happened to the Department of Agriculture. It's an exciting place. It's newsworthy. No one takes us for granted anymore. <laughs> American Meat Institute people were in the other day. And I tell you, it's a new world for them. They haven't been accustomed to this sort of thing. You know, they used to kind of be around there, and Dick Ling and his friends were sort of in charge of lots of things. Times have changed. I regard the customer as, or the consumer as my customer. 
And there are times when you're going to dicker. There are times when we're going to disagree. And there are going to times, times when we're going to be just very upset with what happens because these are changing times. There's one thing I can tell you that is an absolute fact. Tomorrow will not be like yesterday. That's a fact. The question is, and do we have the courage to recognize tomorrow as the beginning, as the first day of the rest of your life? Do we have the courage to recognize tomorrow as a new frontier, as an exciting new experience, or are we going to be frightened by it? I know you. I've been among you. I must say I'm thrilled with the reception here tonight, you know. I've uh, organized a few receptions for secretaries of agriculture myself. Uh, uh, I, I shouldn't really tell you this, but in, in 1957, we, we'd been married seven years and farming seven years, and it seemed like it's gone from bad to worse, and we're living in depreciation, and, and, and Mom was in the grocery store clerking, and I was cutting woods in the wintertime, and we're struggling to hold body and soul together, and, and a secretary of agriculture named Ezra Benson was coming to Moorhead. <clears throat> Moorhead, Minnesota. So we organized a welcoming committee. We had 9,000 people there at the Concordia Fieldhouse. Now, we didn't mean to hurt him any. We just wanted to get his attention. <laughs> and we got his attention. I'll tell you that. He was scared to death. <laughs> and so I, I know what it is like to be involved, as you are. Men and women who have the courage of your convictions, you have the courage to stand up and speak out. Sometimes it's unpopular. Sometimes you're criticized. Sometimes you'll be put down by your neighbors, and the doubters are among us. And so I'm doubly honored to be invited home with you, my many friends, to be a part of this proceeding. I salute you. I commend you. I urge you on. And if you do that which you do so well, as you've done in the past. I know that you'll achieve the objectives that you have set out, a better America and a world at peace. Thank you very much. The first speaker this evening is one that I'm sure that the members of the NFO and farmers in general have a great respect for in the state of Nebraska. His influence has carried far beyond just the borders of the state of Nebraska. And he certainly, as we evaluate a congressman and senator, is not the political party but it's how he stands on issues. He's worked very closely with our Washington office, Chuck Fraser and his staff, and one that I respect and admire as many of the people in the NFO in Nebraska and farmers in general. Gives me great pleasure to introduce a member of the House Agricultural Committee who has voted on the issues as he saw them, the Honorable Congressman Charlie Thone from the state of Nebraska. Thank you, Orrin Lee Staley, my good friend Bob Berglund, our Secretary of Agriculture, our other distinguished guests, and ladies and gentlemen. You know, there's an old golden oldie that 
I imagine most of you have heard several times, but bear with me, if you will. It concerns the recent meeting here in Omaha of the local Yale University Alumni Association. And the Ivy League school had a new man on the alumni staff, uh, trying to do a good job, I guess, and came out here to Omaha in Nebraska, and this was his first speech-making assignment. And he was very, very proud, of course, of the way he had organized his speech. Uh, those of you who have heard it, we recall he used as the text of his address, Y-A-L-E. And uh, he said that Yale, of course, uh, just four letters, but my, what a great institution. And he went on and then extolled the virtue of Y for youth for about 15 minutes. And then he went and used A for ambition. He talked along again for about 20 more minutes. And then he said that L stood for loyalty and it took him 25 minutes to cover that letter. And finally, he revealed that E stood for enthusiasm. And he really got carried away with himself. Talked about another 40 minutes on that. Well, after the meeting was all over, as he left the hall here, there was only one faithful person left there. And when he walked on up to him, why, he found him with his head bowed, and he was obviously deep in prayer, some Lutheran prayer, I'm sure, Mr. Secretary. And uh, <clears throat> the uh, secretary went on over there uh, to him, this alumni executive, and said, it's obvious that I said something here that had a great profound effect on you. And I just kind of wondered uh, what it was. And, this alumnus looked up and said, well, to be honest with you, he said, I was just giving thanks to the Lord above that I had gone to Yale and not Massachusetts Institute of Technology. <laughs> well, I promise you that uh, I'm not going to talk uh, about 34 different subjects tonight. In fact, in many of these areas here, as I look over this crowd and as I know your organization and uh, and your people, I'll be carrying coals to Newcastle. Uh, uh, I was born and raised on a Nebraska farm uh, up in northeast Nebraska. I call that the cultural center of the state there, Mr. Ed Traberti, our fine NFO state president here. But, and I'm proud of it. I think, in fact, I think it's probably the best thing that ever happened to me uh, in those dirty 30s, and those were tough times, as many of you old timers uh, here know. But I'm going to talk, uh, if I may, about some of your problems here, uh, your challenges as farmers. And uh, then I'm going to turn the whole program over here uh, with a little help from Staley and uh, Salhorst and everybody else to the secretary here. And he's going to solve all these problems for you. So. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, I may just quit right now, and I think we'll all be ahead. <laughs> but I would like to quickly acknowledge uh, your organization. Uh, and it's a pleasure to be here with Orrin Lee Staley. He and I have, uh, as he indicated, fought together a little back there in the capital of confusion. And I think uh, on occasion we've uh, accomplished some things for the benefit of agriculture. And again, I'd like to uh, single out Ed Tiberti, mostly because he's a constituent of mine and a voter. Uh, but uh, we're proud of Ed and the work that he's done here, and he, of course he's on your national board. Also, I mentioned him before, uh, the guy that introduced me to Nebraska NFO is Bill Selhorst, uh, who's now in your national office. Uh, Bill and I uh, uh, originally had some, uh, let's call it serious discussions about philosophy and agriculture, and I think, uh, I think he did more of the convincing of me than I ever did of him. Uh, but uh, certainly, uh, Bill tells it like it is. <laughs> Lastly, I'd be remiss. Uh, and I'm going to do all the honors here, Bob, so you can get right into the nitty-gritty of this whole thing to, for agriculture here. I'd like to, though, uh, give a salute to Chuck Fraser. And Chuck, uh, you've got a real old pro uh, who uh, knows the legislative score and uh, gets the job done for you in Washington. Uh, I don't know. Well, I was going to go on a lot further than that, but I'll just say that with the help of Ann, who does most of the hard work there, you folks that have been in contact with the office, uh, Chuck uh, does uh, 
an excellent job, and I'm going to refer to him very briefly as I go on here a little later. But quickly this, I did indicate that I wasn't going to talk all night here. Uh, I would like to salute the NFO, uh, and of course, first and foremost, NFO is a bargaining organization. You were in the business a long time ago in this regard. And I agree with you that ultimately farmers must solve their own problems. Uh, I don't think it's going to come on the banks of the Potomac. Uh, generally speaking, uh, back there, you got more problems than solutions for agriculture, as I see it, uh, with embargoes and quotas and the cheap food policies. And I don't care, as he indicated, uh, Orrin Lee, I'm a Republican. Doesn't make much difference, as I see it back there, uh, who's in charge. Uh, seems to be that a cheap food policy permeates the whole place there, and the State Department ultimately calls the shots. And I don't think that'll ever work uh, for a fair. <laughs> so it boils down to this, that farmers uh, must work together, and I think they must join together and demand uh, their fair economic share. Uh, or we're not going to get long-range solutions at all. And frankly, I admire the spunk of the many thousands of farmers now who are spontaneously organizing to dramatize the terrible problems of current agriculture. And I can testify that some of the city congressmen now are, are more aware of the farm crisis than they were before the strike actions were organized. And certainly, I think all of us should wish the farmers well in their efforts uh, to formally begin uh, this charge on December 14th, because agriculture obviously deserves a better deal. <clears throat> now, there are some things, very briefly, uh, that the federal government ought to be doing uh, that it is not doing. I think uh, that we ought to establish a new emergency credit program. I suppose you also heard about the good news and the bad news. Uh, I think it came out of southeast Nebraska. There's been a little drought down there in the last two or three years in addition to other problems we have in agriculture. And the farmer went into the banker and he says, I got some good news for you and I got some bad news for you. And the banker says, why don't you load the bad news on me first? And he said, well, he says, I just don't believe I'm going to be able to knock off anything on that principle uh, this year at all. As a matter of fact, he says, I don't think I can even pay any of the interest this year. The banker said, yeah, the, that's, the, uh, that's the bad news, huh? Yeah. He said, what's the good news? He says, well, the good news is I'm going to stay with you another year. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think a new emergency credit program is needed for farmers uh, who, uh, at least for two years in a row, have not had their production cost returned to them. Emergency credit is particularly needed for those farmers who have been hit with drought or other natural disasters, as well as the unprofitable prices. Emergency credit is most particularly needed for the young farmers who picked the wrong time to start out in a career in agriculture. Some of us uh, tried to add those features to the recently passed farm bill, but we didn't quite uh, get it done. Now, we had another bipartisan effort to provide uh, farmers with incentive payments for converting cropland to conserving crops. And again, uh, we got shot down on this uh, uh, in the committee. Now, the farm bill assigned into law certainly uh, isn't legislation, as I've indicated on one or two occasions here already, that will solve the farmers' problems for it. But I'd like to, again, remind uh, this audience here that the bill that we passed was a lot better uh, than uh, Mr. Secretary Berglund behind me here uh, got to bring up to the Hill. And uh, as I recall, uh, the Secretary said that it wasn't the kind of bill that he would bring up uh, if he were still the congressman from the Red River Valley of Minnesota. You remember that. Uh, in that bill, uh, the target price for corn uh, for 1977, I'd remind you, was a dollar and 70 cents, loan rate of a dollar 75. So we worked on it a little, and we finally got that raised. And then uh, with the uh, sharp advice of uh, Charlie Fraser, Chuck Fraser, and a couple of other old pros there, why we formed a coalition, as you remember. Uh, the Democrats were uh, Glenn English of uh, Oklahoma and Tom Harkin of our neighboring Iowa here, and the Republican Keith Sebelius of Kansas and myself. And we succeeded in forcing both the target loan prices for the 77 corn to 
and we did the same uh, thing as far as wheat was concerned. Originally, the uh, price there was going to be 247, as you recall. We uh, first raised that to 265, and finally to 290. Another amendment in that bill that I think has got continu uh, con uh, considerable uh, promise for the future here, and uh, it's not a panacea. None of these things are, uh, to be sure. But uh, I had an, added an amendment in this bill, uh, the so-called gasohol amendment. Uh, gasohol, again, is, is a blend of 90% gasoline with 10% alcohol made from farm products. The gasohol amendment provides for a federal guarantee of up to $15 million each on commercial loans to finance four gasohol pilot plants. And as I understand it, the secretary later on is going to announce that one of those will be here in Nebraska. I don't know whether he's, <laughs> but I don't know, I don't know whether he's going to make that announcement tonight or not. But uh, we'll have to wait. Um, more importantly, uh, frankly, and of course uh, these pilot plants are uh, are uh, are necessary. More importantly, in that b uh, legislation, there's all kinds of legislation now in the gas hall field. Uh, but we added in the bill 21 million dollars in research funds by universities. The main need for research is in the developing and marketing of byproducts from the grain used to make the alcohol. When alcohol is made from grain, only the starch, of course, is taken away, and all of the protein remains in the spent grain. Therefore, we have the possibility of helping to solve a couple of problems at once. The gas hall could reduce our need to import foreign oil, and the protein byproduct could provide very good nutrition either for humans livestock or poultry. Now, the Farm bo uh, Bill did extend and amend Public Law 480, the Food for Peace program. But I think some steps here are needed for further improvement. We did make some improvement in this bill, and I assume the Secretary will touch a little on this. But I still think that uh, Public Law 480, uh, to make us competitive with other grain-selling nations, needs provisions for intermer intermediate period loans. And in addition, I think we need to appropriate more money for the Commodity Credit Corporation for loans to overseas buyers who want to buy American grain. Now, together with this legislation, I think we need uh, personnel in the Department of Agriculture especially who will always have strong voices for agriculture. I suppose I could get up here a little and uh, be a little bit of a demagogue or so and uh, challenge uh, our secretary here on this or that, and uh, frankly, I'm not going to do it. I don't think uh, we've ever had a more knowledgeable secretary of agriculture than Bob Berglund. <clears throat> By the way, as I recall, he's a member of your organization, a longtime member of the NFO. He's a farmer. And he knows the farmers' problems. Uh, he and I conspired a little in the, on the House Committee uh, initially when we drafted the Commodity Futures Trading Corporation legislation, which was a good bill in my opinion. We then worked closely on a grain inspection bill. He and I co-sponsored the Packers and Stockyards legislation that took the, in case of bankruptcy, took the, uh, the uh, producer from the bottom of the line and put him at the top. And we were just starting to work on uh, a crop insurance bill when uh, he got demoted from the house and went downtown. Uh, but uh, I do wish uh, that the secretary were supported a little stronger uh, in Washington, uh, White House-wise, Office of Management and Budget-wise. And Mr. Secretary, I'm, I'm going to deviate just a little from this love feast here in one other area here. Uh, I still got a little bit of an argument with one assistant secretary of agriculture named Carol Tucker Foreman. Uh, as we all know, uh, before she joined USDA, she was the executive director of the Consumers Federation of America. And that's the outfit that organized the disastrous 1973 beef boycott. And the cattle producers, and I don't have to tell those of you who are here, still haven't really recovered from that cruel blow. Well, for the past several years, uh, those of us who, uh, in Congress who represent agriculture have had tough battles all over the place. But we've been trying to give 
USDA more say-so concerning regulations, and Bob Berglund helped me on a couple of these areas here, and I helped him in a couple where he was, had specific interest. But more say-so of the Department of Agriculture in these regulations that affect farmers, which are issued by the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration. You've got a bunch of them going right now, and I understand you talked to the Secretary about some of them this afternoon. And the Environmental Protection Agency, they're all over the place on your farms now, as you well know. But here's what Andy Montgomery wrote, wrote in a syndicated newspaper column uh, that appears in many farm area publications about Mrs. Foreman. And I quote, she also said in effect that the USDA's function is not to challenge, but only to defer to the FDA and the EPA. Should they decide to ban further use of antibiotics, pesticides, and other chemicals? And here's the end of her quote on this, regardless of the flimsy evidence upon which they base their conclusions. End of quote. Another little illustration here uh, on Carol Tucker Farman, who isn't my favorite official in Washington, uh, is her attacks on food producers and uh, processors. A few months ago, she said, and I quote, I don't think competition is working when four leading canners Del Monte, Heinz, Libby, and Campbell control 57% of the canned applesauce and 52% of the sweet corn, unquote. Well, what are the facts? Well, in America, 49 companies can corn. Two of the companies, Carol For Foreman mentioned, uh, don't can any corn. In the United States, there are 42 U.S. firms that can applesauce, but three of the companies that she mentioned don't put up any applesauce. And the fourth can's only a minor amount. I have reached the conclusion, which uh, probably is pretty obvious to some of you, that one of the major sources of America canned applesauce is Carol Tucker Foreman. <laughs> and recently, you know, uh, she talked about uh, stopping uh, eating a bacon. Sal Horst, I don't know whether you feel too good about that, but she said that the housewives should substitute nuts for beef. So I say nuts to you, Carol, uh, uh, and uh, let it go with that. I've got some more things on her here, but I'm not going to uh, list them all here. Mr. Secretary, if you want to hear some more of them after a while or so, we can get together. But I do feel very strongly that, uh, that we need uh, strong, vigorous, articulate voices uh, uh, in the Department of Agriculture at all times uh, when we got the basic opposition and everything else we do with the State Department and the, and the uh, other offices that I delineated before. One last uh, point here uh, that I think we have to do a lot more work in is the, uh, in the export area. Uh, here in Nebraska, and I'm sure in all of your states, uh, we're so dependent on a viable, vigorous export market. Uh, and uh, the balance of payments, uh, as you noticed last month or so, a $3 billion deficit. So we need to do everything we can uh, to uh, develop our markets for farm products overseas. Uh, recently, the White House was going to chisel down on our farm attaches. Uh, uh, we're, many of us are objecting to this. I hope that uh, President Carter reverses himself because nothing uh, could be more short-sighted than what they suggested uh, uh, there. Oh, as I've indicated to you here, we got some problems in agriculture, needless to say. I don't have to tell uh, this organization or you people this. Uh, we've had problems in agriculture. We've had problems in this great country of ours before. But, you know, even with all of our trials and tribulations and problems, here we are with 6% of the world's people. And we got over one half of the world's good things. And we're going to solve these problems with the help of you people here and others like you. We're going to solve these challenges. And I would still say that uh, even in agriculture, as distressed as it is today, there are some good days. There are some bright days ahead. And let's hope uh, that the best days are still ahead. Thank you, and it's nice to have been with you this evening.